Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Um, today, I'm going to be speaking with our production assistant, John Dayton, who was kind enough to join me and answer some questions that I had or that you had that I wasn't able to answer. So here you go. I got to tell you something, Judy, while I'm thinking of it. Talking about things that that weren't seen, um, I'm going to point one out. Uh, there was a, the episode where Will is not, not allowed to see Grandma, mm -hmm. um, The Long Night, where he was kept away. It was a wonderful episode for Will, just a wonderful episode. Harry was directing that show, and I remember so distinctly how pushed we were to get that episode finished. It was just one of those times, for some reason, we had to get it finished and finished on time. The last day of shooting was a Friday. The last scene was outside the hospital. And it was a shot. It was a crane shot starting close on Will, who was sitting on a bench looking up at, uh, sitting on the bench looking up at the window where you had just raised the shade and waved, which meant everything was okay. And Will then turns and the shot was close on Will and then back revealing over his shoulder here, the sign that said Charlottesville Hospital. It was a really nice ending. Um, Harry was harried. <laughs> He's <laughs> puffing away on his cigarettes. We got to get this shot. It was really late. <laughs> okay. So we did uh, two takes. I didn't notice anything wrong. And I thought it was, oh, it was great. Second take, just for safety with the crane. Second take. Crane's there, pull, pulls back, and Harry's back there. He wants to go home. And he says, cut print. And he turned around so fast and headed for his car. And I'm running alongside him with him. And I said, Harry, Harry, did you not notice something? And he said, what, what, what? No, it's perfectly good. I said, Charlottesville is not spelled right. On <laughs> He said, oh, really? Nobody will notice it. And he was winning. <laughs> now, I checked the episode today. And there were signs, sign at the lumber yard, Charlottesville Lumber. Yeah, oh, that's fine. C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-E-S-V-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. The sign of the hospital on that final shot, they forgot the E. So it's C-H-A-R-L-O-T-T-S-V-I-L-E. <laughs> a blooper. People love a bloopers. A big one. <laughs> yes. A big one. I don't think anybody's mentioned that. Um, wow. That's in, funny. in all those years. And I remember it being such a funny moment with um, Harry as he's running to his car. Nobody will notice. Nobody will notice. Nobody. Will notice. Well, and without the endless, you know, the, the fact that in reruns and that people have now seen these episodes so many times, so many things that people point out to me as errors or errors in continuity or all kinds of things. I don't think people noticed when you just saw it once, you know, yeah. I think it's really, you know, there probably were things, but you know, for the most part, I think so many of these things have come to light because we can watch it over and over and we can stop it and we can freeze it and we can, all the things that you couldn't do in the 70s and early 80s when we originally made them, you know? Yeah. So um, about the cameras. Early on, um, probably through, I'm going to guess, season four, um, we used standard Panavision cameras. And those cameras had been around since like 1950s, early 50s. Um, it was uh, a, 
a stationary camera, basically. If you wanted to move it, you had to put it on a crane or put it on a, a dolly or whatever. Uh, and it was a large camera. It was a, a very large camera. So Panavision came out with a Panaflex. And that was a smaller, compact camera um, that could be easily set up to do handheld. Um, moving around, it was very light compared to what the Panavision camera was. And uh, that really, actually, for Panavision, that the whole industry changed because everyone who was using these big old Panavision cameras switched over to Panaflex. And um, I talked to Eric about this. Uh, um, I was asked to go down to La Costa and demonstrate how to assemble and disassemble and use a Panaflex um, by Lee Rich. Lee asked me to go. Of course, I said yes. And um, Eric went with me. And I believe Ellen did also. Huh. Um, For people who don't know, Lee Rich was one of our executive producers uh, mm -hmm. with Lorimar, mm -hmm. um, one of the owners and founders of the company. Yeah. Lee, a big boss. <laughs> yeah, it, he was a big boss. It, it was his, it, it, the whole thing was his idea. Lee, Lee uh, was given the book and read the book and decided that it would make a good movie and uh, sold it to CBS. Um, Merv Adelson was the money man who basically um, got into the company with the money. Uh, and Lee always insisted that um, all creative decisions were made by Lee. And in my experience, that was the truth. Uh, Lee was a wonderfully creative man and also very generous in giving over the, if you were really qualified, he would just give you over that job. He wasn't a micromanager. He, he knew how to hire good people and knew that they would do their job. Hmm. Um, so you went down to La Costa. So we went down, so I went down to La Costa. So that's how I learned that camera. Wow. Um, we also used for a long time uh, Kodak uh, 5247 film, which was had been in use since the early 50s. Again, uh, was an acetate based negative film which provided incredibly good images, especially for us, because the tone of the show was always warm. You, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. We wanted to, yeah, we wanted a warm feeling. Not So much today is on the cool side, but we wanted that warm feeling. Um, and I recall Emil Oster came on as a DP for some of the shows that I worked on. And at the time, the company, Lorimar, wanted to, was economizing. And we flopped stock over to Fuji. And I don't know my, remember how many episodes were made with Fuji, but the Fuji just didn't have, it came out greenish. It didn't have that warm feeling uh, that the Kodak film did. Uh, ironically, Kodak went out of the film business and Fuji still to this day is in, in the 35 millimeter film business. Hmm. But for us, one camera, a load of film, which was seven minutes long, which really restricted you because uh, your master couldn't exceed. You didn't want to exceed maybe six because you'd be on the end of a uh, a load um so yeah seven minute loads and when that was the, the load was printed a loader would take the film out the film would go into a case the case would be put aside and in the evening all the film was shipped over to uh consolidated film or cfi to develop now, was film ever misplaced? And the answer is yes. 
I remember, don't remember the episode, but I do remember it was a Friday and the lab called and it was late. And I answered the phone and they said, well, where is such and such? And I said, well, it was, you guys have it. And they said, no, we don't have it <laughs> on the Friday night, which meant that if they didn't have that film, it was somewhere between stage 26 and CFI in Hollywood. If that film had been lost, we had one choice and one choice only. And that would be to refilm everything that was on that seven minutes. Um, and I will say that it was a great relief to know that the film was found. And I believe, maybe wrong, but I believe that it was left in the truck um, that took it over. But today, that wouldn't happen because um, not the way we shoot today, digitally on a thumb drive, you know, or we're on chips now. And uh, so, and by the way, today we can film 30 minute scenes. You know, we're, we're not limited by a seven minute reel of film. We're limited by memory. And uh, also we can have multiple cameras. And also we have video monitors. And the way we shot, we had one camera, one person looked through the lens and that was the camera operator. And as we cut, on set, we'd say cut. The camera operator would literally open the Panaflex and look at the gate, which is where the film passes between um, the lens and the receiving lens to make sure there's no dirt in there. Or if you look at some old movies, you might notice every once in a while, a uh, hair will flip up or a, there'll be a piece of dust that'll come. So the way that we confirmed, um, well, we, we confirmed the sound. When you cut in a scene, you say cut. We'd first confirm okay with you with sound and then okay with you camera. And uh, then the camera operator and the director of photography would make the decision. Yeah, it was good. Um, if dust or hair showed up, later, uh, then it was not a good thing. Uh, but I don't ever remember that happening. I don't ever remember that happening. Yeah, I just uh, remember that all, there always being that, okay, check the gate. Yes, you the know. gate, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The gate, the, the gate meant literally letting in the light, you know, so you let the light in and you have to make sure that that path was totally clean, totally clean. Um, yeah, I never read, call it, it, having any problems with that but we had great D, dps or directors of, of photography um i will say one thing um when i mentioned that the camera operator is the only one looking at what was going on in the film that's it yeah um the rest of us uh the actors only knew if they gave good performance um, and the rest of us in our own departments had to determine if there was any, anything had gone wrong just by standing there on the set, like makeup, hair. Um, on set, we would look at those things. Today, um, and I worked on a show several years ago at Fox um, with a new system and multiple cameras and um, video monitors. Uh, now, the call that would normally be, so you do a take, the call that would normally be for us, the camera operator, and our decisions, did it look good from where we were standing? Now, it becomes tent city, is what I call it. <laughs> you have all of these monitors, and you have all of these people, and on the show I was working on, we had guests that would look at it and they would say, oh, didn't you see this? Or, you know, you'd have 50 different opinions of what 
was there, what we had shot. And it, it's a little bit bothersome to me. Whereas with us on the Waltons, one camera, one person looking through the lens and print it. That's all yeah, you had to really trust your, your camera operator to have what was in frame, in frame. Absolutely. And also to gauge, you know, the smoothness of what was happening and did, did we get what was there? And, you know, and then you trust your focus puller to make sure that everything's in focus. And yeah, it was a whole different thing. And the director could just stand by and watch the performance live. But, you know, I mean, things I've directed since then, yeah, it's like you stand as a director at the monitor and you watch the performance through the monitor right. to make sure you got what you wanted and that you got it on in the frame the way you wanted it so you you know it is a whole different uh whole different world and that that kind of takes a, the authority away from the director of photography in a way um because and and the camera operator because you're making a decision based on what you really see through the lens and 20 other people are making a decision on what they saw in the monitors you know um, to be honest, it takes, a, the show I worked on took a lot longer because of that. Yeah, you can't, you can't direct by committee and you can't create no. a show by committee. Everybody has to, it works best when, I mean, yes, it's a collaboration. It always is. We have a million people coming together and each doing their piece of the puzzle, but ultimately you have to let everybody do their job. Mm -hmm. And you can't micromanage, you know, everyone's going to have their own opinion about what they see in the monitor and what they want to have happen from their department. Mm -hmm. And that's not really what it's about. And sometimes, you know, there's per more perfection in the imperfections, if you know what I mean, you know, that that is becomes the charm of it, you know, the People charm. Say, oh, you know, I, 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 I was watching an episode of the Waltons and I suddenly saw something, somebody going through the trees in the background on a bicycle and, you know, the guy looking through the lens was busy focused on what was happening in the foreground, not the guy, you're not catching the guy going through on the bike or you see a boom shadow or, you know, usually they would catch if the mic kind of dropped into shot. But yeah, yeah, you know, there's well, those errors, you know, <laughs> you know, we had what was called the ground glass, which is what the um, camera operator looked through. And that glass had a rectangle. OK, a rectangle line. Mm -hmm. And that was known as the safe zone. So sometimes there would be most often a mic or something that the camera operator saw, but was outside of the line. So it meant that for television, it was no problem. Today, we see full frames. So there are a lot of shows you watch today and you will see things that you probably shouldn't have seen uh, because the camera operator let it go by because it wasn't in the safe TV zone. Because that safe TV zone had rounded corners, uh, which is the way televisions were in those days. And um, now the other image, the full image, which included the TV plus outside that was used on the cameras for a features um, right. where the squared off corners and, you know, a whole different uh, yeah. ratio. Aspect. Aspect ratio. Yeah, it was yeah. different. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I have for you for this segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. I want to thank John Dayton for joining me and, and answering some of those questions and taking that little stroll down memory lane together. I'll see you next time for more behind the scenes of the Waltons and more Ask Judy. Thanks for watching.